Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and this is the show where you can have your property related questions answered by our team of property experts. And joining me today is John Reynolds, CEO of Titan Property Developments. Welcome, John. Nice to have you back. Thanks, Stephen. And Dr. Daniel Moses, CEO of Property Wealth Education Limited. Welcome to you, Daniel. Thank you. Right, we'll get straight on with the questioning. And uh, Daniel. At what point should I be looking to instruct a con contractor on the refurbishment of my first HMO property project? And what should I look for when going out to find one? This is a question we often get. I mean, I, some, somebody pulled my leg about it the other day. I said, well, don't you, don't you ask to go and see the work that the builder's done before? And he said, no, you don't, because he's only going to show you the good jobs. He's not, he's not going to show you the ones that have gone wrong. And I suppose that's a very valid point. Um, so what do you look for? Do you look for an HMO refurbishment specialist or what do you do? I think I've always, you know, I've always said this property investing is very easy. At the same time, very difficult. All right. It's not rocket science. The truth is when you're looking for a property to convert into an HMO, it's always very important to get a, a contractor, you know, carry a, tr a contractor along at every given point in time. So you know exactly what the cost of the refurb is going to look like and visit many, you know, uh, refurbishments that has been done by multiple builders. So you have a clear indication of what the cost will look like. So the ability to get it right from the beginning is carrying the builder forward, you know, to, to, to see what they've done, uh, carry them along to see the properties you're looking to convert into an HMO will, will help you keep your cost down. So you'd involve him almost at the purchase process? Yeah, I would, I would, inv I would involve my builder from the get-go. I've always done that. And the reason why I've always done that is to know exactly what my projections are on my worst case, on my mid case, and to my best case. And, and my, my building costs have always come back in time in terms of the cost. So carry them along. Otherwise, if you don't carry them along, you're going to have surprises where, you know, for example, building cost of materials, building cost and material costs and labor costs and every other thing mm. is gone up right now because of inflation. So the better it is for you to carry them along from the from the on from the from the get go. All right. So you know exactly what that's going to look like. And again, do a lot of due diligence and you have to make sure they have the appropriate you know, protection you know, you know, policies in place from, from, I always check in with my builders whether they've got their key man policy uh, pr protection, they've got, uh, building, they've got the construction insurance, and uh, we're very clear on what the penances look like should you not deliver the product, pr project on time. And so the list can go on and on on what I look at. Yeah, I think, I think one, one of the most common mistakes people make, especially at the beginning of their career in property, is they forget to count into the equation time. And I think one of the important things is when you have a, a constructor that you're going to appoint is to look at whether he's actually got the ability and, and, and the capacity to do what he's telling you he's going to do. You know, if it's a four man job for six weeks, yeah, that's fine. Has he got four men? Yeah. Or is he going to have to recruit them? So I, I think these are the, you're smiling away. Of there, course. John. Yeah. Yeah. And I think actually you can incentivize them as well. So, I mean, it's in your interest to, to get them, uh, particularly what you do, tenanted by a certain time, That's because then you can start advertising. Yeah. And so you can say, if you get this uh, project ready by a certain time, then there's a bonus. There's, there's uh, yeah. you know, further, further money to draw. In the same way, you need to have a contingency. You know, the contractor should be having a t contingency in, you know, 10%, 12%, yeah. Yeah. depending on the project. If it's a really yeah. old property, then probably a bit more. Yeah. Um, and actually then if you factor that into your numbers, I often use that contingency as in the sum of it for uh, the incentive towards them so that yeah. they've got something. Because um, finding a good contract, which is why I'm smiling, finding a good contractor can be tough, right? And you don't have to keep hold of them when you get hold of them. Because even you mentioned bringing a contractor in from the beginning. I've had some of the, dare I say, wealthier, more accomplished builders, contractors that have actually tried to take properties off me from the beginning. Particularly in, in younger years when, you know, um, you're sort of finding your own way and you've I found a property because you come and help me check this all out and cost it out. And all of a sudden the agents are saying, I've got a bit of a tricky situation here. You know, so the more you can be self-sufficient to a point, the better, but then absolutely, you know, particularly if it's your first project, but yeah. choose potentially through people you know. 
you know, that reputation is really important. But isn't this, you know, the, the same as we've discussed many times before, John, it, it's about building your team. Mm -hmm. so, so, you important. know, you have a good QS, you have a good architect, you have a good contractor. Yeah. And you, you, you build your development team, don't you, over yeah. a period of time. And that's worth trillions, isn't it, really? Yeah. Your team, your team is the only way you can survive when it comes to property development, uh, whether that being a small scale or a larger scale development at any given point in time. Your team is it's your, it's your reason why you're going to succeed and become successful. So when you're starting as a newbie, it's very, very important that you carry every single person along, have your time projections correctly aligned, uh, because that will save you a lot of money as well. And I think one of the biggest issues we have when you have contractors is if the contractor become unwell, if something happens mm -hmm. to that contractor mm -hmm. and they are unable uh, to, you know, pull the project through. And this is one of the reasons why I don't joke with pol I don't joke with insurance policies, you know, uh, as to when I am employing that con contractor to come yeah. on a project. Which you know, is your key man policy. Yeah, which is your yeah. key man policies. So if you're not, if you're out of the job for a week, do we have someone else who's going to take that project to the next level? Yeah. You know, and again, building all of that into your uh, your contract. Yeah. It's very essential. And also, I, th I think the final point on this, and I, th I think John would agree, is also your, your your point of communication. Who is it that you're going to communicate with during the refurbishment process or building process? You know, that line of communication is very important, isn't it? Because you, if you're not careful, you speak to the wrong person, they'll misinterpret what you said, it'll go back, that'll cost you money, they'll get their claims book out. And... Yeah. No, totally. I think the other thing as well is if, if it's your first project and you have the opportunity to spend time on it, immerse yourself and, and talk to the trades that the contractors using and, and get to know them and just make sure you're aware of what's going to because you're only going to be a much better landlord and developer for the next one by doing that rather than just yeah. completely. Some people it's not an option, some people invest passively. And in, a good contractor will, will never be shy of letting you speak to his electrician no. or his plumber or whatever else. It's just part of the service, yeah, part, isn't if it? They, if they're good at what yeah. they do, they, they'll be proud of what they're doing. I think the other thing is pay them when they are due to be paid because so many contractors get knocked and are so nervous about yeah. not getting paid. And so if you, uh, particularly for that project, let alone your next one, they'll remember you for yeah. being someone in And it might be you have disagreements on things and so on, but when money's owed, pay it, pay it. because that always comes well, back. Well, I was always taught, you, you pay your money and have the argument afterwards. Yes. Because yeah. 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 you're on the high ground. Yeah. And just, just to quickly add to, to that as well, I think, as a newbie investor or someone who's doing the first project, as you mentioned, most times people like to talk on the phone a lot to a contractor. Every single word that is communicated on telephone, put it back on an email and make sure they respond back to you that it's all clear. Yeah. That will save you thousands of pounds. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Absolutely agree. Yeah. All right, John, um, slightly different subject and it's about mortgages, which... Um, you need to have in place to sell your properties. Don't you? So uh, there we are. Do the panel think it's time to revisit the subject of alternative mortgage products? Taking into account the recent increases in cost and inflationary based limits of salary increases. I'm thinking of low deposits, extended terms of, of uh, uh, loan length, and perhaps loans that would stay with the property rather than the person capable of being passed down to the family's next generation. What do you think? That's interesting. There's quite a lot there. Yeah. And the answer to the question is yes. It does. It's what, it is, what is it that is going to be done? You know, we've got, we've got a really suppressed market now. You know, if there was more fluidity of lending, we'd have a lot more sales going through. We, we all know that. So we were talking off camera about yeah. uh, the more entrepreneurial side, the more yeah. um, it kind of what's the creative way of doing it? It needs something that the government agree with, that RICs agree with, that could uh, ultimately free that up. Sitting here now, I don't know what that is. You know, um, income multiples are probably at the maximum that they can be. Um, you know, you're only going to cause problems if you raise them to try and get more people coming in. It's, mm -hmm. it's potentially more help to buy, for example. That was a great initiative, you know, forgive me, I don't know if that's actually been replaced with anything, I don't think it has. I don't think it has. But that worked, it was abused at times, but it worked. 
So I don't know if that was mentioned in the question, but that was something that I benefited from as a developer and other people were able to benefit a, coming in. So I have another developer contributor who tells me that actually helped to buy helped the developers a lot more than it helped the people buying. That yeah, I, I think <laughs> I, I saw both sides. I was the developer selling, but I also saw that what it allowed, what I saw a lot of was bank of mum and dad got involved. Yeah. So the grey pound, which actually is a great, you know, if you look at it from the government's point of view, they want to unlock that. They want to be in a position where that money's freed up. And that helps the next generation. That's that's a key part of solving the housing crisis and so on. So that's I saw a lot of that where they thought that's a great initiative. I'm going to help my son or my daughter. I'll put the money in. So, John, what I did read in, in in report recently was that the the view is for 24, 25, that whilst it's still unclear the path of interest rates. Well, I know one or two. Lenders have come down a little bit this last week or two, but the, the general trend is a bit unclear how long it's going to take to, to come down. They were saying that lenders are probably going to get quite difficult about, about um, taking any kind of entrepreneurial view of lending. You know, it's going to come down to very strict facts, very strict criteria to to, to, to lend. And I think if that's the case, that's fine. I don't blame a lender for wanting to be careful, to be cautious, because I've always thought, you know, you were talking about uh, 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 multiples of salaries. Yes, you might get a broker that can persuade a lender to go from times five year earnings to size six. But I, I'm not actually sure he's doing you a favour because it actually is getting you to overcommit. And he's just trying to get you to a position where where you get the mortgage rather than worry about whether you can pay it or not. So I think I think it's important to have the criteria in place, but I think it does beg uh, the question: Should we have extra products? And I I think we've been a bit slow to look at interesting new ideas. Yeah, and I think we needed to jump on that the moment the interest rates were going up. You know, it was about fighting inflation. Um, I think the house price curve was just continually surging, particularly on the back of COVID, which was mm. a, a complete anomaly, a moment in time, but it, mm. it sent prices in certain areas, particular skywards, and they were trying to control it. But then there's still a shortage of housing. There's still people that want to buy. Again, talking off camera, you know, the, the, the market's not dead. It's just financially, it's it, there's not enough products. Um, but yeah, I, what, what that would look like, what's brought in, I mentioned help to buy. Who knows? <laughs> it needs more creativity. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay, well, there we are. I'm going to go to a break now. We'll be back in a few minutes' time and we'll be asking John and Daniel more questions on your behalf. Join me then. Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Question Time. I'm joined by Dr. Daniel Moses and John Reynolds. Welcome back, guys. Thank you. Daniel. I've been saving for several years to be in a position to start investing in property. I'm now at a point where I have a good level of funding and a good deposit for my first project. However, all my closest friends are now saying that it's a bad time to get into property investment. Some guidance here would be greatly appreciated. What do you got to say about that? Daniel? I always say this, that there is never a wrong time to invest in property. Uh, simple statistics is that you know, over the last 1,000 years, you know, property tend to go up in value every 10 to 15 to 20 years. So if you understand the cycle and you have a strategy and you have a straightforward plan on what to do, then you've saved enough money, buy it and wait. So I, 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 I also say this all the time, don't wait to buy, don't, don't buy, don't wait to buy real estate, buy real estate and wait. <laughs> you just have to wait. You buy it and then you wait. It's a waiting game uh, for it to appreciate. D Daniel, you talk about a thousand years. I'm old enough to know about most of those thousand years <laughs> and, and, the, and, the, and the ups and downs. And there's a few hiccups on the way. <laughs> well, there will always be hiccups. Life isn't fair, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> but you're saying about the best time to buy. I would always say the best time to buy property is yesterday. Yeah, but, always. You know. Just buy it and then wait uh, for, for, for there to be a capital appreciation. But, but, but you but said you, it, you've got to have a strategy. So, oh, yeah, so you, 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 you've got, got to be strategy. prepared you've, for You've got to have a strategy trust. and you've got to have time for that strategy yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you have to have time. You know, this is one of the things I say to people all the time because I talk in different forums as a panelist, speaker. Real estate first is not a get rich quick. You buy it, you wait uh, for it to appreciate. I give a simple statistics. There was one of the properties that I own sold 
in 1994 for 64,000, sold again in 2020 for 190,000. I bought the property for 470,000 in 2020, uh, 2020, just before the lockdown. So you can see over time, property will always go up in value. Mm. You know, that property that is worth 470 at that time I bought it, it's not going to ever go back to be sold at 64,000 pounds. No. No. So real estate do, is a long time game. Do, do, you, do you believe in following investments around on, on, on what's happening commercially? I mean, let's take in London, for instance, there's a lot of people that invested in properties that followed the course of the Elizabeth line going, going across London. Yes. Um, is that a good strategy? Yes, it is a very, very good strategy. I mean, look at the Queen Elizabeth line, Abbey Wood, just next to Woolwich. Okay, many years ago, you wouldn't buy a property there because the transportation connection was pretty very bad. But today you have the Queen Elizabeth line that goes through all the way from Abbey Way through to way to Woolwich and all the way to Reading, you know? So yes, you can follow that line. You always look at regenerations, mm -hmm. yeah. okay? You look at immigration, you look at population, you look at growth in the local economic statistics in order for you to make informed decisions when acquiring assets. Okay, and advising our viewer that's written in here, what would you say, do that research on the internet or? Are, are the companies that you would go to to get that information from? I mean, education, uh, it's, it's, it's very key these days. There's, there's a lot of books that can be read on, you know, on property investing. There are a lot of, you know, YouTube. Not least your own. <laughs> there, there's a lot of YouTube channels uh, that are out there that you can actually follow to see people's story, real life case studies, and, uh, you know, multiple educational seminars that are there. They're really good ones. Mm. You know, it's all about doing your due diligence and knowing where to get information. But one of the things I always say, uh, do not go for, you know, if you're looking to get into property, do not go to the wrong person for the right advice. Find the right person mm. who's worked the work and let them show exactly what to do. Yes. And make sure that fits with your own finances, your own time schedules. Yes. Your own availability, I suppose, to concentrate on your new oh. business. Yeah. I mean, property is a business. You know, I, I always say this, property is a business. If you're looking to buy where you want to live, it's completely different. Mm. But if you're looking to start earning from property, then you're looking about, you know, setting up a business. So in business, it takes time for it to go. And again, 90% of businesses that do start up, not a lot of them that do make it to the first five years. Mm. So these are all different things that they have to consider. Mm. Yeah. So, to, to use the strategy, because some people want to get involved in property emotionally, fascinated yeah. by property, whether it's you know, particularly English people. Yeah. But just buying a property to try and make money over time without a strategy is seriously dangerous. Of course, well, you've, I, I, you've got a great uh, yeah. strategy model which you're educating yeah. people with. It's just knowing that you can weather the troughs. We're in one now. But actually, if that's uh, sales values dropping, actually the rental values increase. So if you're focusing on yield, yeah. you're in a better but, place. But John, you're right. That, that there are a number of people that think if you buy property, you have this God-given right to make money. Yeah. And especially today, where refinancing is difficult, if you make a make, if you make a mess of your financing, it's not that easy to change these days. Or not, not like it used to be. It's very expensive. Very to expensive well. to change. Legal well. fees. There's an arrangement fee. There's yeah. an exit fee. Yeah. Um, and before you know, if you haven't factored that in, you know, and this is all back to strategy. Yeah, strategy is very very important, you know? and that's yeah. why it's so important for you to. To, to find those who've already worked the work for them to teach you exactly what to do. I mean, the biggest problem is, is there's a very um, big issue with influencing as well these days. So people are getting influenced in the wrong way to thinking that property is, a, again, I say it again, get rich quick. It takes time to make good mm. money in property. Yeah. You're not gonna get into property today and make money tomorrow. And there are, so, there are so many factors. I mean, for instance, you. Looking out the window here, you can see blocks here with 600 apartments in the block. Mm. You know, if one person in that, per in, that, in that property decides they need to ditch their property very quickly and sells it off at a 30, 40% discount, that's set the level for your block because the values will pick that up and that value will regurgitate within that building. Mm. So, so you can be subject to a lot of very critical factors here, yeah. can't you? Yeah. Yeah, but I think ultimately, you know, back to the question, if someone's got the money, they've saved and they want to, uh, they want to get into property, and then obviously there's a lot of negativity about the property market at the moment, that's ultimately in their favour potentially because the market's slower. You know, there's more opportunities 
there may be some people that are in difficulty and of course depending on what your strategy mm -hmm. is you might get a better value on that property then you actually build in a bit of equity over time because the graph ultimately as you say is always going up yeah and again it depends on the type of property that they will be looking to sure. buy at this yeah. particular market yeah John, I, um it's quite a while since I've done it. I, do we still have trouble with valuers in the new development market? Do you really want to ask me that? Yeah. Do you really? Do you think yeah. it's exactly as it was? If anything, it's worse. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. And of course, they're you know they're scarred from you know certainly the the spike in 2021, um, and I was surprised there weren't more down valuations then. So anyone selling now, potentially depending on where they are and what the product is, is selling for less than what they bought just two years ago. And because of that, surveyors are even more finicky and cautious, and that's never a good thing. So it's still the fight it was. Still a fight. Still a fight. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm doing this now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right you. Okay, um, John, again, another subject I'm sure close to your heart. It says, do the panel think that along with the government, there'll be a rowing back of green requirements in the world of property development? Now, I, I know that you have developed a wide range of properties mm. i think from barn conversions to multi-unit you know apartment blocks right. um still doing it I, i'm presuming that on the sort of house building side rather than the flat building that it might be a bit more critical in terms of sales to to demonstrate the green credential credentials yeah. of the thing. yeah yeah you're absolutely right um to, to answer that part of it you know the purchases that are coming forward wanting to buy product particularly houses and anything that's relatively characterful, they what they're expecting uh, all, all the, as much of the, the green kind of benefits as possible. So they're looking for you know, rainwater to be caught. They're looking for air source heat pumps. They're looking to see what you're doing in in the loft and so on. Um, whereas where it was going with EPC ratings, which of course was the big thing, and I'll, I'll address that in a minute. You know, there's there was it's difficult if it's an existing property, and of course a lot of people sold up a lot of existing landlords were pretty scared pretty terrified i think we probably all knew people that were like i've got to sell my property before the government uh, deadline and then the government relaxed it you know yeah. and i think some people would have breathed a sigh of relief some some people may have taken the chance that they see how unorganized the government is and how you're actually going to enforce that and then got away with it but i think the thought process was good um to do that but as a developer, for example, uh, in, in one of the councils, which I won't uh, name, suddenly they brought in a, a carbon uh, zero policy mid planning uh, application. And for me to then try and address how to factor all those costs in was tens of thousands of pounds. And I've not factored that in, in a suppressed market as well. And so we were having a bit of a fight. Now that still stands, that's, that's local government, not uh, central government. So mm -hmm. it's a bit of a mess. Um, but if you're a developer actually providing product, if you're a purchaser looking to purchase, they're, they're actually looking for that. They want the green you know, benefits and essentials. So you're under, under pressure to provide them. Yes. I, d I did do an interview with a, a, a building manager who again manages one of these blocks with five, 600 units in it. And we were talking about what you can do retrospectively in some of these mm. apartment blocks to, to try and pick up the uh, you know the green cores and it's it's quite difficult it and difficult. quite expensive isn't it it is um, and, and i mean sorry just one other thing i mean we were talking the other day on the program about um gas boilers you know that they're going to be outlawed apparently well um they, they were saying that you know actually what a lot of people are doing because gas boilers are cheap they're buying a spare one putting it in the cupboard and waiting for the day the original one wears out and they'll just just replace it, <laughs> you know. Well, I'm sure we've had a conversation on previous programs about something similar that's brought up electric cars and the yeah. whole thing with diesel. I think, yeah. you know, when something works and it's established, you know, it, the next phase needs to be relatively seamless. Sure. That's not been the case here. That's probably the best way of answering, you know. It, and, and yet I'm all pro it. We all want to be sustainable for the planet. It, you know, we need to be embracing green but it can't just sort of all come at once, you know, and that's me looking at it as a developer, let alone the landlords that have got properties where they're getting an income, but they haven't got the cash to then suddenly have the outlay to have improved those properties to make it happen. But, but yeah. why, why is it, John, government can't think ahead? I mean, listening to the news today, I think although they've cut back on HS2 and limited it to, to, to Birmingham, mm. 
I, forgive me, whoever it is, if I've got the figures wrong, but it was roughly that the cost of going to Birmingham was £60 billion. It's now jumped up to £80 billion. I, I just don't know how you can make a £20 billion pound mistake in just in, in just a period of a few months. Yeah. And it's the same with that village. They were going to convert to hydrogen gas, you know, so people run their kitchens on hydrogen gas. And now they've suddenly decided that's far too dangerous, not going to do it. Mm. But of course, there's been a lot of investment in getting ready to do Huge it. amount. Of, yeah, mean, huge amount of, of consultancy. Why, 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 and why isn't somebody looking at well, it would be like it'd be like us agreeing to do a development and doing part of the due diligence, getting two thirds of the way through, and going, well, "Guys, this isn't going to work. No one's mm. going to live here. We can't find the right tenants, and we built it all wrong." I mean, you wouldn't do it. No. So, why? Back to your point. Why has that been allowed to happen? You know, there's been some shockers, and this was this has also affected a lot of people outside of property that are trying to be in that sustainable space, pledging a commitment to what the government ultimately you know, wanted to do, and then they've they've pushed it back. So. Not ideal. Such is life. Mm. Well, there we are. I'm going to say a big thank you to Dr. Daniel Moses, CEO of Property Wealth Education Limited. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming in. And John Reynolds, CEO of Titan Property Developments. Thank you again, John, for your Pleasure. input. Thank you. Good to see you both. Um, look forward to you both coming back in the future. That's all we've got time for today. So join me again next time on Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin. Look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.